start a new series today, uh, Who is God? And we're just taking a few different Psalms over the next few weeks and what they reveal to us about the nature of God. And uh, I have the privilege of kif- kicking that off this morning. And uh, this morning's message, there's two title options if you're taking notes. Uh, I couldn't decide between the two, so you can go with whichever one floats your boat more. Uh, one option is God in the gray. God in the gray. Or the other option is life without lack. So they'll both make more sense, but I don't know what you want to put at the top of your notes there. Let's turn to Psalm 23. If we can put that up on the screen, we'll leave that up for today. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. This psalm we're going to break down today has a few little hints in it for us to get some context and why I'm saying God in the gray, where it says that he leads me That is a unique Hebrew word that doesn't show up very often in the Old Testament, but it shows up two times. One of them is in the account of Exodus, with God leading his people through the wilderness for 40 years before they'd be able to enter the promised land. And the other time it shows up is in the book of Isaiah, where Isaiah is prophesying a time where the nation of Israel will come out of Babylon, sort of modern-day Iraq, and be led across the wilderness back into the promised land. This is not a fair-weather psalm. This is a wilderness psalm. This is a psalm that teaches us about the nature of God when life is not going to plan, when our marker points in life have fallen away where there isn't the stability of cities, but there's the danger of the wilderness, is such a psalm. And there's something so powerful about this psalm. There's a reason why it would most certainly be the most known piece of scripture across the world. It's read at almost every funeral. People can recite a few lines of it, whether or not they've been to church. It would be a familiar piece of literature, and it's because it's captured the imagination of people understanding who God is and how he relates to us for millennia. There's something precious about it. There's, something, it's the, there's a reason why it's turned up in morning liturgies since they were written. Since my father passed away, Four years ago, I didn't feel like reading the Bible much, but I grabbed a hold of this psalm, and every day I recited it, I memorized it, I thought about it. When I lay in bed with my eyes closed, I thought about it in the evening. When I woke up, I thought about it before I got up. When I was feeling down, I thought about this psalm, and to this day, I pray this psalm every day. I think about it every night before I go to sleep, and I I pray it every morning again. And if you wanted, like, if you could do anything from today's message, commit to memorizing Psalm 23. That just, whenever you need to call upon it, you can go, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. And you can find the comfort, the connection, and the truth and the stability that practices like this can bring. I know not everybody grew up in New Zealand. But I grew up partly in Australia and partly in New Zealand. I know we've got people who grew up in South Africa. We've got people who grew up in Rwanda. We've got people who grew up in all different sorts of places around the world. So not all of us have similar experiences, but I imagine most of us grew up in 
places like New Zealand or places like Australia and things that we can hold in common. What I didn't realize as I was listening to a a historian the other week is that if you grew up in New Zealand or Australia over the last 30 or 40 years of history, that you have grown up in the most peaceful, prosperous, and predictable time in human history. In all of humanity, the most peaceful, predictable, and prosperous time. And I know not everybody had a good childhood. I know not everybody has had a great story. But the overall context, our story has been placed in partly because of our location on the globe. Far from war. Far from famine. Far from these unstabilizing factors, partly because of our nation's history, partly because of the the good parts of our Western ideologies, we've grown up in the most peaceful, prosperous, and stable time in human history. But then there was Wuhan 2019. Dum, dum, dum. And then there was March 2020. And then there was the rest of 2020, 2021 and the start of 2022 and it would be easy for us to think that those unstabilizing factors these things that most of us could have never imagined in our 30 to 40 year bubble of the understanding of the world it would be easy for us to think these things are over but the world is changing like we haven't known for the last few decades I mean, I could have even just in the church, I could have never predicted the landscape. I could have never predicted how polarizing the time would be, how challenging it would be. I could never predict that that would cause people to lose their faith or that others would respond by digging in like they've never dug in before. The hatred, the malice, the online, ugh. It was the discipleship stress test of the church And in some places, great gold was revealed. And in other places, in many places, great fractures of our faith and our communities were revealed. And that's okay. It needed to be revealed. There's a part of it that was necessary. I mean, I learned some things. I learned that just because people attend our church doesn't mean I'm their pastor. I learned that people's online networks are forming them more than their physical community that God put them in. I learned that we need to go deeper and we need to assume way less. And as I said, it'll be easy to think it's behind us. But two weeks ago, I went to the supermarket and I couldn't even get sugar. A couple of weeks before that, couldn't get lettuce. And these might seem like silly, trivial things, but the indications of a world fracturing and systems that we used to be able to rely on to be predictable no longer being predictable. The war in Ukraine, interviewing young Ukrainians, they go, I can't even imagine that Russia would ever invade us. I thought the world has changed. That's a 30 or 40 year bubble you've been living in. Our human history is marked by wars and invasions. The life we know on this side of the world is the exception, not the rule. The rising power of places like China, rampant inflation, global destabilization, supply chain challenges, political polarization like we haven't seen in a long time, hyperconnectivity, we find ourselves in a very new place. What will be will never be again. And what there is to come is not yet revealed. The grey zone. The term was coined uh, when actually Russia, Russian soldiers started turning up in Crimea a few years ago. They weren't in uniforms. They spoke Russian, but they wouldn't say what they were doing there. And all of a sudden, they're standing outside guarding government facilities. Onlookers and journalists looked on and they go, well, this isn't war. But it also was not peace. This is the gray zone. There's a lack of certainty around the future. There's mass resignation. 
There's dissatisfaction like we've never experienced before. There's depression, anxiety, there's lost connection. We're more connected often with people on the other side of the world than with the person in the next letterbox along. We're struggling with keeping the power grid going in winter in New Zealand. Sri Lanka has no oil. This is a weird time. And I still can't find sugar. <laughs> what type of worlds, what world will our kids grow up in? What type of jobs will they have? Will they ever be able to own a home? No. What, it, what they're training for, will they even like that job when they finally get it? Chances are not. We're in a gray zone. But like Genesis chapter 1, where the earth is void and it's formless, and there's no marker points, the Spirit hovers over that place, ready to do something new, yeah. ready to move in profound and powerful ways because God is in the gray. God is in the gray. We love the imagery in the scripture, I think, of cities, you know, walls, predictability, control, prosperity, peace. But the reality is most of this book identifies the human journey with a wilderness experience, not a city experience. And I know that's unfamiliar to most of us in our lives, but this is the territory we're learning to walk in. God is in the gray and we can know a life without lack in that place. So let's Break down Psalm 23 today. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't like being called a sheep. But God doesn't seem to have a problem with it. It's better than being a goat, according to the scriptures. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. What's easy to miss in this is that the psalmist is not just trying to help us understand like farming metaphors and our place in that shepherd is actually a term for a ruler or a king in the ancient world every king would have been considered a shepherd of their people so this is as much royal imagery as it is farming imagery okay the two overlap in the psalm and come and go in their parallels Kings were shepherds in ancient cultures so to declare the Lord as the grand shepherd or later Jesus would say he's the great shepherd, to declare our God as the ruler above all rulers is to say that he is a certain type of ruler. He rules well, therefore I lack nothing. Lots of rulers did not rule well while their job was to make sure there was food and still waters and restoration and safety and all of these things that this first stanza of the psalm talks about. Most rulers, like most nations, fail. But here's the psalmist pulling back from their national identity and going above to a godly identity and going, when God is my shepherd, when I live life like God is my ruler, when I live life like I am his subject, not just a, a citizen of New Zealand under the rule of whatever party it is at this particular time, but when I am under the rule of God, I'm under the type of rule that rules well. That rules securely, that provides, that thinks about every citizen. While we can have better versions of culture, while we can have better societies, while there's differently ways they can improve, they'll never be perfect. But under God's rule, there's enough. You can read sort of this first bit two ways. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That's actually supposed to be in the part above, but never mind. Um, you could read the, the, this part like just through a provision lens. You could read it going, he's the type of ruler that is good. He feeds me. He makes sure there's drink for me and that there's safety on the paths for me. He restores my soul. You could read that. It literally means he keeps me alive. Like he keeps me going. There's enough sustenance in him. 
He keeps me alive for his name's sake, which means he works and rules and provides. He leads in alignment with his character. His character is said in the last stanza, goodness and mercy. In alignment with who he fundamentally is, he leads me. Or you could read it a different way, and you could read it through a rest lens, not just a provision lens, although the two are intertwined. And you could see that there's echoes of Jesus here going, why do you worry about tomorrow? Why do you worry about what you'll eat or drink or what you will wear? God knows what you need. Doesn't each day have enough worry of its own? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You can read this through the lens that it's trying to call you to not worry about the stuff of life, but to know you have a provider, and when you know that, you can rest in it. It's Your soul can be at rest because God's got it. There's enough. It's an invitation in the wilderness journey of this gray zone journey that we're in. It's an invitation to bring rest to the inner person because it doesn't matter what happens in the gray. God's got it. And he's got you. There's nourishment. There's refreshment. There's guidance. He knows the right way and he'll protect you on it. You know, sheep only lie down in a few different circumstances. There has to be a few conditions to be right for a sheep to take a load off. The first is they can't be anxious. They only lie down when they're free of fear. The second is when they're free from tension with the other sheep. The third is when they're not tormented by flies or parasites. And the last one is, is when they're free from hunger. This picture is if you'd let the Lord lead you in life. You could find yourself without anxiety, but with peace, without friction between you and your neighbor, but with restoration, without wondering where your next meal is coming from, but content and satisfied, whether it be with much or little, as Paul would say. He's the voice leading us to rest. He's the voice leading us to his word, leading us by his spirit He's the presence making a way to provide for us. So where is God right now in your life? Where is he? He's the one leading you on the right paths. He's the one calling you to be the best version of who you could be. He's the one saying, calm the farm. It's going to be okay. When you hear that thing in your mind go, it's okay. This will all work out for the good. That's his voice. He's the one in the wilderness season of your life calling you to take a load off and trust him. He's in the gray zone. And I wonder if as we walk this next season out as a church, if we can learn to pay attention to the voice who leads us, to the shepherd who rules, who says, take a load off, lie down, Experience my peace. Trust I have you on the right path. He knows what you need. He's the whisper in the wilderness. Because his rule is active in your life, each of these stanzas has like a declaration and a response. He leads me. He leads me. So I lack nothing. Because he's the one leading my life, I lack nothing. If I'm the one leading my life, I'm going to lack some things. If Jacinda's leading my life, I'm going to lack some things. But if the Lord's leading my life, I'll lack nothing that I need in my life. But then the psalm moves from this picture of abundance, like life often does, to a picture of a desolate place. This meadows and ample food and peaceful streams and restored soul changes to the valley of the shadow of death. You can know what's coming. It will come and go in our seasons of life. 
The, the journey always takes us from abundance to desolate places and back to abundance. We move to the desolate and here there is a new promise that he is with me. He, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This is the theological center of the psalm. It's amazing that in the first stanza, the Lord is my shepherd. In the last stanza, I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The only two places the word Lord shows up are at the beginning and the end. But right in the middle is this like bit, and this Lord is with me. In the desolate place, he doesn't just lead me, but he is with me. His presence is here. It moves from the second person or from the third person to the second person. He's no longer talking about ideas about God, the psalmist. He's talking about his experience of God being with him. It moves from ideas to intimacy. And this is what God wants to do in the gray zone of your life. He doesn't want to be an idea. He wants to be known. He wants you to be able to not just go, oh, yeah, the Lord. He wants you to be able to go, my Lord, he's with me. There's a shift. Even in the darkest valleys, where is he right now? Even in the darkest situations, in the deaths, in the losses, in the disorientation, in the business struggles, in the injustice, in the sickness, in the failures, in the falling aparts of our lives. He's right there in the midst of them. Not always fixing them. Not always revealing his grand plan. But that's not what we need in the desolate place above all else. We don't need understanding we need presence. We need intimacy. In your suffering, in your battle, in your setback, in your wrestle, in your doubt, in your attack, He is with you. And He is with me. When I'm tempted most to think, when God is far away from me, why is that always the worst parts of life? Where did we get our idea that when life is going good, God is more present than when God, life is going bad? Where did that come from? It didn't come from here. Because God shows up the most in this book when things are the worst. His presence is most experienced when things are their hardest. So why do when, when things go hard, we go, where are you, God? Probably the same place he was when it was good. Right there with you. It's just you didn't feel like you needed him then. It's like um, I've heard it said that a lack of prayer in somebody's life is always a pride issue. Because a lack of prayer reveals that you think you can do it on your own. You don't need him to live life. You don't need him to make decisions. You don't need him to reflect his character. You got this. It's only the desperate, dependent life that prays. And God will be more than happy to lead us through seasons of life that will cause the desperation to be found inside of us, where the facades will be stripped away so we'll realize what the Bible told us all along. You're not as in control as you think. You need him. This rod and the staff that give comfort. This is back to, this is like a play on words once again, the farming and the royal. It's the words actually, the, the royal scepter is with you. Do you know, who's with you matters, eh? I remember being a kid walking home on my own in the evening. I walked pretty fast. I grew up in an interesting neighborhood, Titahi Bay. But when your mates are around, you just enjoy the journey. You're not wondering what's around every corner. When God's with you, when you're conscious and aware of his presence with you, it changes the way you walk through life. Yeah. And that's what the psalmist wants us to understand. And so if the first promise is he leads me so I lack nothing, the second promise is he's with me so I'll fear no evil. 
He's with me, so I will fear. If, that, if, God, is, if God leads me, if God leads me, I'm going to be all right. If God is with me, I have no reason to fear. We don't lack his presence. And then we get to the third one. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What a beautiful picture. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The third revelation is that he is for us. He is for us. This is the picture of a gracious host, a royal banquet, laying it on for us, an unworthy guest. There's more provision of food, and it's God's character to provide, to bring us out of desolation, back to a place of abundance. This is the kingdom pictures of the scripture where Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a wedding banquet or like a feast. And he sends out the invitations, come sit at my table. The oil is a symbol of gladness. You know, we use the Bible to interpret the Bible. In Psalm 45 verse 7, it says, therefore God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness. Your, the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Oil was for anointing, and anointing was representative of God's Spirit, not just being around us, but it being on us, it being in us, it possessing us, a special touch on our lives. And Psalm 16 says, in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. So when this Psalm says, he's for me, he anoints my head with oil, it's like, here comes joy in your life. Here comes gladness in your life. Here comes that thing that can't come from circumstances, but can only come from God, the joy of his presence, not just around me, but on my life. The oil, it's not like, you know, we, we pray for people with oil, get a little bit out of the tiny little jar, just a little bit on the forehead. No, 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 the Bible, get the jug out. I don't care what clothes you're wearing. And just joy, joy at the Lord's table. And then, as it, just because it's really cool, Psalm 45 where it says he anoints us with the oil of gladness is actually a messianic psalm. It's about Jesus. And it's a prediction of what Jesus would come to do for his followers. So it's like Jesus is coming to make sure everybody who wants that oil poured over their head can have it everyone. Then there's the cup of abundance. A cup overflowing is messy at a dining table, but it's a great metaphor for life. It's not just enough. It's more than enough with God. It's not a metaphor of somebody living a life with God that needs to hoard, protect, be stingy, ration. It's a metaphor of generosity. It's saying when I'm with God, even in the wilderness of life, I understand I have a cup that overflows. What do you need? You need help. Here comes help. What do you need? Do you need money? Here comes money. That from the person's life who understands this walk from God, they don't hoard because they don't just have enough in their cup. They understand their cup's designed to overflow. You can know when a follower of Jesus is getting it because they become generous. If you haven't become generous, you haven't got it. If you've got a tight wallet, you don't know God like the psalmist wants you to know God. If you're tight with your time, tight with your energy, tight with your tithes, tight with your offerings, tight with people that need help, if you are tight, you don't get it. And your prayer today needs to be, God, would you reveal yourself as the God who makes my cup overflow? Because it's not designed to just fill you up, it's designed to go everywhere. He wants to work through you, not around you. This is so beautiful. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. These are two very significant Hebrew words. The first is kehest. That's the word we get mercy from, or in other translations, loving kindness. And the second is the word tolb. It's where we get the word goodness from. And these are both, once again, like if you were a Jew that knew his Hebrew Bible really well, you would be reading this and go, 
Moses, Exodus, I know these words. These have been in the scriptures before. And in Exodus 34, like Moses is asking to know God's glory, to know his character, and God comes and shows himself to Moses, and he announces about himself in front of Moses in Exodus 34, verse 6, and says, the Lord passes before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. This is his character. And then the word goodness is a place where when, when God has to walk past and hide Moses' face so he can only see his back, so he can just get a glimpse of the glory. This is what Moses said in Exodus 33. He said, please show me your glory. And he said, I'll make all my goodness, all my tolb, Pass before you and you and proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious and I'll show mercy on whom I'll show mercy. In Psalm 100, we're told to praise God because of his kahest and his tolb. We're told in Psalm 106, his kahest and his tolb should cause us to praise him. His goodness and mercy. Psalm 107, Psalm 118. This is the character and nature of God. We don't praise him because of what he does fundamentally. We praise him because of who he is. And he's goodness and mercy. And here's the crazy thing. That kahest and that tolb, they shall follow me. But that is a really bad translation. Because the word is not like follow like meandering behind something the word is pursue it's to chase down which is ironic because most of the times this word is used in the psalms it's talking about the enemies pursuing me but here the psalmist goes actually i see life a little different (laughs) where other people see enemies chasing after me i see god chasing after me with all of his character and essence, his goodness, his mercy, his loving kindness. It's following me everywhere I go. I can't get away from it. It's like an internet troll. Doesn't matter what you post, they're there again. He's chasing us everywhere we go, not with judgment, not with condemnation, not with an angry look on his face, with goodness and mercy. I'll show mercy on who I want and I'll show my goodness to you. I'll reveal it to you. It's so great. It's so powerful. I even have to hide your face from some of it, lest it overwhelm you. It's pursuing us. And let's not miss this last bit. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The house of the Lord, all of this has been very personal. Me and Jesus. Me and Jesus. But I shall dwell in the house of the Lord as a communal image. It's an image of people gathering together. Nobody went to the house of the Lord alone. You always were there with your family. You were there with your friends. You were there with your people. And so the psalmist goes, he leads me, he leads me, so I lack nothing. And he's with me, so I don't have any fear. And he's for me, so I get to dwell with him and his people forever. These are the revelations of God The assurance that comes from a life with God inevitably leads us to a life with his people. This is inseparable in the scriptures. So where is God right now? He is for you. Those places where grace and mercy and favor and luck are showing up in your life are the places where God is on the move. He's chasing you down through everything life throws at you. God's in the gray, and we can have a life without lack. I love it's like abundance, wilderness, 
abundance. And there's something about that last picture that isn't like the first picture, because what starts off in the fields and goes through the valleys ends up in the security of a house. The wilderness will give way to places of security. But you've got to walk through the wilderness first. Jesus turns up. John 10 verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd laid down, lays down his life for the sheep. Man, if you knew your Bible, you'd hear him say that. You'd be like, Psalm 23? This is that guy. This is the one who leads and is with and is for me. And look, he's proved it. Today, we're going to go into a time of communion. And today, I want you around the table over the body broken for you from the good shepherd and the blood poured out for you by the good shepherd. I want you to put your trust in the shepherd. Maybe you haven't ever decided before today to put your trust in the shepherd. Maybe you didn't even know the shepherd before you came here, but his name is Jesus. And today he invites you to his table in the presence of your enemies to put your trust in him. Maybe today you have wandered away from being led by the Lord and it's your time to come back to him around the table of communion today. Or maybe you're just recognizing, oh yeah, we are in a gray wilderness time. I need to put my anchor in that throne room of God. I need to put my hope back in that place and trust the shepherd anew all over again. I want you to imagine doing life with a bunch of people, living like that psalm's true. That's the sort of people I want to be a part of. 